Hey, Jason, we got Josh on the line. What do you want to ask him? If you were to pick like one or two keys to your success, what would those be? Focusing on one thing at a time, you know, being able to really align your attention on one task, you know, long-term project, whatever it is. That's where I really started to see traction was when I was able to not be as scattered in my efforts, try to stretch myself too thin, realizing that it's a lot better to give 100% to, to one task than 30, 40% to five or six. Hey, I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast, and this podcast is different from everything else out there. I bring together new and aspiring investors on each and every episode and let the aspiring investors ask the questions that they need answered. And if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably have the same questions. So before you get to this episode that we have prepared for you, make sure you hit the subscribe button and that little notification bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now enjoy the show. Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe with Streamline Capital. Very excited for today's show. We've got a uh, second time guest, Josh, play with us as our experienced investor and Jason Marcordes as our aspiring investor today. So guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So as is tradition, Josh, we're going to talk with you first. So I guess last time you came on the show was April 2021. It's been been a hot minute. So go ahead, reintroduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm a multifamily uh, operator. I primarily focus on helping individuals utilize their self-directed retirement accounts using existing retirement funds, placing them into commercial real estate. Uh, that's kind of my wheelhouse. And prior to getting involved in in multifamily, I had gotten involved in retirement funds when I was 16 years old mm -hmm. and uh, kind of have been operating with a Roth IRA since then. Mm -hmm. And that's really kind of what gave me the experience in in using retirement funds and, and kind of moving you know that ball down the line. And um, I eventually kind of turned that into uh, an understanding of how self-directed retirement accounts work mm -hmm. uh, and then was able to kind of use that my, for myself. Uh, that's kind of how I started off uh, just by mostly passively investing myself and understanding how mm -hmm. they work. And then I gained enough knowledge and realized I was able to kind of pass that along to, to other investors and and give them an idea of, you know, the, the right uh, foot forward to, you know, getting started with their own retirement funds. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So, so you, you specialize in placing retirement funds, which I think, I think a lot of people have the retirement funds available. And you said you started at age 16. Yeah. That, okay. Did I hear that right? Yeah. Yeah, he did. Okay. Well, can we dive into a little more detail into that? You know, how, how that start happened? Yeah. Uh, so I come from a, a long line of, of like CPAs and mm -hmm. uh, they've, they've all kind of just been continuously drilling into me from a young age. The, mm -hmm. You know, I the, the value of compounding interest and uh, and just the the importance of starting young. Uh, and so I kind of had just you know pretty simple you know average story. I had worked a a summer job and I had a, you know just some funds. It wasn't enough that it was it was really worth keeping myself. So they suggested, mm -hmm. hey, you know, put it in a Roth IRA. We talked about what it was, mm -hmm. and so opened up one of those accounts. It was you know not super exciting knowing that I was going to lock away money from the age of sixteen until I was about sixty, yeah. but. You know, I, I, I was, I was, and always have been obsessed with aviation. So uh, I actually put the the money into a an aviation and defense fund, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of invested in what I knew at the time. Yep. Uh, it did pretty well, and I've just kind of been contributing to it ever since. Nice, nice, nice. So started contributing to your your IRA at age sixteen. Awesome. So what gave you the idea to start focusing on finding investors with the these retirement plans, self directed retirement plans? Yeah. So I actually, I would say I kind of like fell into it. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I, I had started off, you know, for my own reasons, I had started passively investing and mm -hmm. uh, using the, the existing funds that I had. And I'm analytical by nature. My, I previously had worked as an analyst, uh, a data analyst, and I dove into all of the details as much as I could, because I really mm -hmm. didn't want to get involved with, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions and, and in this space, uh, the one that I operate in, it, there's a lot of vague answers. And so I kind of wanted to dive into the tax law mm -hmm. and understand a lot of the nuances. And that took me the better part of like two years uh, because yeah. you just kind of have to hop around between you know, service providers, CPAs, lawyers, mm -hmm. and everybody who might have some insight into little things. And once I eventually had that, that knowledge, I felt comfortable investing myself. 
I gave mm-hmm. a little presentation on it one time, just kind of at a local real estate meetup. And mm-hmm. my friend who was putting it on at the end of it, he said, Hey, that was really good. You should probably, you know, start, you know, finding investors that way. And, and, mm-hmm. you know, it's a, it's a great method for getting to know people and, and helping them use their funds uh, to, to invest in real estate. Awesome. Now, how do you go about specifically finding people with funds? Are, are you posting a lot about it on, on social media? Do you have other, what, what's kind of your method for finding that? I'm not as good at social media as I should be. It's something that I need to pick up on. But uh, I have found that there's a really big need for kind of more direct answers. And so I've actually partnered with a lot of custodians themselves. And I've I've been on their webinars uh, because there there's a, is a taxation involved potentially, and it's called UBIT. And mm-hmm. we don't have to dive too far into it, but uh, I kind of specialize in in understanding the details of that and how it's calculated. Mm-hmm. And that's a thing that a custodian can't necessarily fully address and advise on. And yeah. so if they bring in a third party, uh, they've been much more, you know, open to to me talking about it, coming mm-hmm. on and kind of giving, you know, investors a better idea of what that picture looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's been a great way of kind of connecting with people who already are interested in using their existing funds. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. And for, for those who are not familiar with what UBIT is, can you can you go into that a tiny bit? Yeah, absolutely. So so this is present when you're using what's called a self-directed IRA. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when you invest in commercial real estate, we're typically going to be using loans, you know, large commercial loans. And so what happens there is your tax deferred dollars in your self-directed IRA are partnering with non-tax deferred dollars from an outside lender or bank. And uh, the IRS is okay with that. They just say, you know, you need to pay tax on the portion that is brought in from, you know, the bank or the lender. And so that portion of income is called unrelated debt financed income, UDFI. That's Mm -hmm. the income you earn. And then UBIT, the unrelated business income tax, that's the tax you pay on that income. Mm -hmm. And so you, you know, if if you've got 75% leverage, 75% of the income might be eligible to be taxed. But the cool thing is you can also use 75% of all the depreciation that gets mm-hmm. involved with the investment. So you can offset a good bit of the the gains in the, the cash flow as well. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And that's that's one thing that uh, that a lot of people, you know, don't understand exactly how that's calculated. You know, it's uh, you know, I, I've seen YouTube videos and I, I've noticed you've got the UBIT calculator accessible on your website as well. So if people are looking for you know, hey, if I use a self-directed retirement account, you know, to to invest, you know, what's what's it going to cost me in terms of taxes? Because I, I I know there there is there is a little bit of extra tax there. Now, ju- just in general, you know, does the UBIT change returns drastically for someone who's investing in a in, in a syndication? No, I, I wouldn't say it does at all. Uh, there, it's kind of it's funny because there's. There's kind of this, uh, it's, I would call it like a boogeyman. A lot of people kind of, you know, lord it over people's heads and say, hey, you're going to incur a lot of taxation if you invest this way. Um, and that's essentially why I built that UBIT calculator. Uh, mm-hmm. It was originally for myself, and now I've made it available to the general public. And yeah, it, it can basically take pre-tax earnings, mm-hmm. projected earnings, and crunch them and give you post-tax earnings. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the the tax tables, they max out at like 37%, but you never come anywhere close to that because as I mentioned, you have all the, the depreciation you can use. You can use operating and interest expenses to help offset mm-hmm. things. And ultimately what I found running you know thousands of deals through it, I found that it results in about a 12% tax at the end of a, a deal. Okay. And that's all on, on the profits only. Yeah, you usually have enough uh, losses to actually offset the cash flow. I've mm-hmm. never seen a, a IRA have to pay uh, UBIT on the first, you know, four or five years of cash flow. Mm-hmm. It's usually when you have a, a capital gain, that's when you're going to be seeing a tax uh, um, that you have to pay. Awesome, awesome, interesting. Well, hey, thanks, thanks for thanks for diving into that a little bit. So, I think it was very, very helpful for for a lot of people. So, next thing, you know, you say you say that you're focused on finding investors with with money in retirement accounts. I'm sure you take investors with just regular money as well. Let's talk about, you know placing that money into deals, you know, what, what are you looking for in deals, operators, whatnot? And if you got an example you want to share, that'd be awesome too. Yeah, absolutely. So we're typically going to be targeting, you know, light value add multifamily. Uh, it's going to be in the range of 150 to 300 units. Mm-hmm. Uh, we specialize in the Southeast. And so most of our projects have been in Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of the Florida market. You know, mm-hmm. there, there are some insurance issues we're working through right now, but the demographics that are supporting the market are phenomenal. The um, mm-hmm. in-migration is is astounding in, in mm-hmm. Florida. So yeah. we've got a lot of properties in the Sarasota, Bradenton area. Um, mm-hmm. one, in, one in particular was a, uh, a class A property that we bought. It was a 2016 property. And the reason we bought it is because it was actually still a value at play. It was mm-hmm. uh, it was built, and and when it was built, it was actually twenty five percent of it was allocated to to low income housing. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, the builder had actually built out the entire property, kind of to builder grade level, not really class A property. And so we were really able to go in and you know go through all the units and bring them up to whatever a class A standard would be in that market. Okay. And so that's given us the ability to kind of provide a, a really nice value add uh, mm-hmm. because the class A product is really commanding a lot more, especially in Florida. It's been a, a, a wonderful deal to be a part of. Awesome. Yeah. It, it's hard. To, you, usually when you hear 2016 build, it's hard to really think value adds on that one, but it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if, if there's a certain portion that's, you know, allocated to low income housing, you know, I, I can see builders, um, you know, really easily just, okay, Hey, low income housing, we're going to stop right here and and keep going. Well, awesome. Awesome. So Sarasota, Bradenton, you say where, where a lot of your deals are, a lot of good dynamics there. How did those hold up during the, the last hurricane? Do you have any big issues on any of those properties by chance? No, thankfully, uh, we've, we've been I mean, spared fairly well. Uh, we have one property that's down in Venice. Mm-hmm. And uh, last year, Hurricane Irma kind of went through right as we were in the process of closing. We went back down and uh, we were able to do a you know a, a, another reinspection, mm-hmm. uh, take a look at everything. You know, that, that property, that was probably the hardest hit property we, we've had. And it, it sustained somewhere between a hundred and $200,000 in, in damage. It was, it's a big property. It's over 200 yeah. units. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of just soffits and, yeah. you know, cabanas got ripped out, trees kind of got torn up and so it's just replacing that kind of stuff. But, yeah. uh, thankfully that area doesn't seem to really get hit by hurricanes too much. Just the geography, they usually spin off to the mm-hmm. North. We found, uh, that's kind of why we are comfortable targeting that area as well. Nice. Nice, nice. Awesome. Shifting gears slightly, let's let's talk about, you know, your motivation and what I call your big burning why. So, you know, what keeps you motivated? Yeah, I can actually hear her now. Uh, she just woke up from her <laughs> nap. But <laughs> my daughter, uh, she's two and a half years old. And it's it's been, you know, I started building this company essentially because mm-hmm. I knew I was going to have mm-hmm. a, a kid uh, at some point. I did. And I, I wanted to be there every step of the way. Uh, I kind of, the way I kind of describe it is, I, I want to be in the the Monday to Friday. I want to live my life in that range. Um, I kind of developed this when I was living in Colorado and I was I was skiing. Uh, yeah. and there was a big shift between skiing on the weekend and skiing between Monday and Friday. It was so much you know, better Monday through Friday. It really is. It really is. Yeah. Uh, I got spoiled because of it, but it made me realize, you know, I'm going to the, the grocery store Monday through Friday. I'm going to, you know, go ski Monday through Friday. And mm-hmm. it's a different dynamic to live with that. And so being able to, you know, live a, a, a less um, rushed life, a less crowded life, being able to be with my daughter, uh, work from home and and mm-hmm. see every step of her, you know, development's been critical. And I've actually seen her develop at a phenomenal rate because, you know, she's got two parents at home and uh, she's got constant attention. Yeah. So it's, it's been the, uh, the blessing of my life and it's, it's really cool. Love it. Love it. Yeah. My, my big brain, why I gets home from school in about a half hour. Well, the why is, I guess we got, we got, uh, I don't know. Would you call five kids a bunch or a gaggle? I don't know what you would call it, but uh, right. yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, we got a lot of them. We got a lot of them. So, well, cool. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Last thing for you, and that's what's coming up next. Yeah. So I, in this kind of time of, of transition, especially in multifamily where, you know, deal volume has been lighter, I decided to kind of get re-up on my, you know, education that I'm providing uh, to the general public. Mm-hmm. And so I, I originally had already built, you know, kind of like a, a video course on how to use self-directed retirement accounts, but mm-hmm. I kind of want to dive deeper. And so what I did was I took every question I've ever gotten from, you know, passive investors on how to use these funds, like all the intricacies, how to sign a document, how transfers work, you know, every little yeah. question that I, I had received. And I turned mm-hmm. that into like a three to five minute presentation. It's 25 videos. And so I created a Basically, it's called the investor's nice. guide to self-directed retirement accounts. And so mm-hmm. it's it can run, you know, folks through how to use the existing funds and specifically, you know, use them to passively invest in commercial real estate. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice, nice. And where where can people find that? Uh yeah, it's it's available at learn to self-direct.com. 
Okay, cool. Uh, we'll make sure we put a, a link to that in the uh, in the show notes for anybody who's who's interested in that. It sounds like a pretty pretty cool little tool. Yeah, along with that UBIT thing, I think you've got the the market cornered on you know helping people invest through their their self directed IRAs. So that said, we're gonna shift gears and bring Jason on. So Jason, welcome. Thank you again. I appreciate uh, appreciate you having me here. Yeah, no problem, no problem. So do us a favor and tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Jason Marquardis. I am born and raised in Chicago. I have an extensive background in property management. So I started working in the property management field, actually for my uncle's company uh, when I was in college about 12 years ago. Went to a couple different uh, corporate PM companies. I think over that 12-year span, I've managed about 4,000 units. Mm -hmm. And five years ago, I left the company I was at. I started my own property management company. So that's been quite the journey. We're uh, right around 400 doors right now and just trying to trying to scale. Nice, nice, nice. So, you know, digging a little deeper in that, you know, talking about, you know, why's, you know, what's what's your reason for, for doing it? My reason, I mean, it's, it's much like yours and Josh's. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, uh, a family as well. I have a, a very large extended family mm -hmm. and it's really that flexibility to, to be able to spend time with them. And really like the way I look at it, if you're going to work, you know, you're going to work hard, you're going to work that 45, 50, 55 hours, you might as well work for yourself. Mm -hmm. And really like, if you're going to work for yourself, you might as well level up and work on things with a higher ROI. So that's really the transition from property management to the multifamily side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I've not been in the property management game, but I, I've heard that the- yeah, I know. I've heard the returns are razor thin there. So, um, I mean, we've dealt with lots of property management companies, but, uh, you know, that's that's something that I haven't jumped into yet. I And I say yet because eventually, you know, we are going to bring property management in-house. So, you know, um, but hey, well, cool. Anything else that you want to share about you or that you think that uh, listeners should know about you? Not necessarily, again, you know, extensive property management, asset uh, management background, and just, you know, early on in uh, the multifamily transition. So just mm -hmm. trying to do what many of your listeners are trying to do. And, you know, I already own some some um, small multis. I actually just sold uh, two self-storage facilities a couple weeks ago, and I'm just looking to really scale up and how do I land my first 50 or 100 unit building? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll do our best to help you with that and, uh, you know, get you across that finish line. And that said, hey, Jason, we got Josh on the line. What do you want to ask him? All right. Well, thank you, Josh. I appreciate you taking the time. My yeah. first question, I guess, would be your success. I think you're close to 2000 units like that is uh, very impressive for, for anyone, let alone someone your age. So I guess if you were to pick like one or two keys to your success, what would those be? I kind of identified it, you know, within a, a year or two that really narrowing down into, uh, you know, one specific, not just a niche, like, you know, we've heard what I talk, I, I generally focus on, but focusing on one thing at a time, you know, being able to really align your attention on one task, you know, long-term project, whatever it is, that's where I really started to see traction was when I was able to not be as scattered in my efforts, try to stretch myself too thin, realizing that it's a lot better to give 100% to, to one task than 30, 40% to five or six. You know, I don't know those percents don't add up, but uh, you know, you, you kind of get the, the picture there. It's mm -hmm. um, you, you crush it through one project, you move on, you crush it through another. And that really has elevated my ability to provide extreme value in anything that I put out and uh, mm -hmm. you know provide to investors. So that's really the the key thing when I've, I've seen, you know, success driving for me. Got it. And what is that, that one task, like for you specifically, uh, what would that be that you want to spend, you know, most of your, your time doing? Essentially creating education and content for, for investors, helping them, you know, understand as best as they can. So just identifying places that I can reach out to investors, kind of, you know, talk about what I do and uh, find new places that people who may not have heard about what I'm doing where they're at. So kind of finding reach and finding, uh, you know, new topics to, to discuss. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. Real estate, as you know, is a team sport. So I would assume you have partners. Do you have the same partners on every deal or like, how does it work? And like, how did you find your partners? That always, I don't know, something that always interests me. 
Yeah, and it's a tricky one. Uh, it's it's sometimes difficult to find partners or find the right ones. And so I don't have the same partners on every deal. I've had the same partners on about half of them. And so really what you end up finding is you really find out what specifically you're looking for in a partner. I have found that the number one key for, for me is, is communication, mm-hmm. the ability to kind of ahead of time communicate, uh, be transparent, you know, just really being proactive with communication is key because I've had some deals where I wasn't really happy with the partners I've been with uh, and their ability to to let us know what's what's going on when they're asset managing. So that's been tricky. But you kind of, as you move through this and you learn really, you know, who the kind of people you want to work with, you start to kind of focus on, on working with, you know, maybe two or three partners consistently. Uh, yeah. And I ended up finding all of them. I've been a part of a, a real estate a mastermind community called Think Multifamily. Mm-hmm. So I generally was finding my my partners through that program. Um, and we were kind of, you know, buying deals together. And and a lot of us stuck together from deal to deal. Uh, it's just not identical from deal to deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On, on a similar vein, I think finding partners, you know, starts with, you know, collaborating. You, you start doing little things. And I mean, what Josh said, absolutely vital. You know, you start seeing what you want in partners. Communication is huge. You know, when, when the lead sponsors aren't communicating well and you're kind of like in the middle, uh, if you're playing that middleman role, it's, it puts you in a very difficult situation. But essentially, you know, at one point, you just got to take the leap of faith. You know, there's, it's kind of like a marriage. There's no 100% way to test drive a marriage without getting married, you know, if if that makes sense, but it's Mm -hmm. similar in business. You know, there's no 100% way to test drive the business, you know, without jumping into business together. So I'd say you do everything you can up front to make sure that there's alignment of interests. Mm -hmm. Um, And then eventually you just take that leap of faith and hope it goes well. All right. We'll work yeah. hard to make it go well. How about that? Not hope. Absolutely. Thank you. Let's see. I guess I don't know. I I don't know if you mentioned like how long your your journey has been in real estate, but over the course of that time, like how has your investment philosophy or your you know buy box like how has that evolved over the years? Yeah, you know it's it's interesting. Um, I've been in it for about five years now, and I would say that the influence I've had on my you know kind of buy box. It's, it's moved across sectors. Um, I've realized to not, I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion to not be as, you know, sector focused. Mm-hmm. A lot of our acquisitions have been in multifamily. Um, but last year we did our first development deal uh, and huge fan of it. It's actually three miles from my house. So I like mm-hmm. a lot of the dynamics behind that. And yeah. uh, just realizing to, you know, not, not just actively, but passively as well, moving into different sectors, you know, car washes, self-storage, things like that, uh, just uh, being, you know, more diversified, uh, you know, as I kind of grow older, uh, realizing that it's it's good to kind of spread things out across. I, I really like real estate and I don't anticipate yeah. kind of going beyond that, but trying to find all the different opportunities that lie within it. Yeah, I like that. Now, I mean, I, th- I think a lot of people, especially people who are, you know, raising capital for deals, it makes a lot of sense to, you know, be able to diversify a little bit. I'm in a different position where I'm lead sponsor. And and for me, you know, my pivot has been to focus, you know, and to go deep, you know, so, but very different situations that we're both in, you know, he's placing capital with good operators, which gives him a lot more flexibility. But for me to get achieve success, I've realized that I do have to go deep. I have to focus on, on one Metro. It has to be a Metro large enough to build a business. And that focus is, is what's brought a lot of results. Mm. And part of learning that came from recording 450 episodes of a a podcast and getting people like Josh to, you know, speak words of wisdom. So there's that. Brent, real quick. um, What Metro are you, you looking at? Salt Lake city. Salt Lake City. Okay. Yeah. I assumed with all the Utah gear that I've seen you wear. Yes. So. Yes. You know, and, and just off camera, just slightly out of reach on this side, I've got a Utah hat that usually goes on when I, you know, don't like how my hair is falling, but uh, yes, I've got a lot of Utah gear. Yeah. I've heard a lot of good stuff about Utah and Salt Lake City over the years. So yeah. good stuff. All right. Do, 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 do. Knowing what you know now, Josh, over those, you know, you've been at it for, for five years, mm-hmm. knowing what you know now, like, would you, if you were to go back and tell yourself something five or six years ago, like what would that one piece of advice be? That's, that's interesting. I'd say maybe focus on kind of the longer term picture, you know, now knowing what we know now, uh, I'd love to say, you know, only invest in fixed rate deals, but uh, you know, it's, mm-hmm. 
that's wishful thinking. The hindsight is 2020. Yeah. I couldn't have told 2018, 2019 me that. And, you know, you wouldn't have gotten any deals done at that time either. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, I, I, I got to be honest, I wouldn't change a whole lot because at the time, I think I was making the right calls for what I had in front of me. And I still do, but I, I wouldn't change a ton, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. I, you know what, I, I get asked that question a lot. And when I, when I look back, you know, I'm, I mean, I feel the same. I mean, there, there's lots of things that are market dependent, but I, I think what I focused on would have changed. You know, I, I, I got into a partnership early on and I was, you know, when I gave you the advice about that part, about partnering, you know, a lot of it came from, you know, my experiences with partnering. But when I got into that partnership, you know, we decided to do things together exclusively and, and buy properties. I remember thinking at the time that this is probably the best thing for now, but it's not what I want long term. And I, I think going back and, you know, pulling a line from Stephen Covey's book, you know, the seven habits, you know, you begin with the end in mind. Okay. Look at what you eventually want to get to and don't sacrifice, you know, good for now for what you want, you know, further down the line. And I mean, I'm, not, I'm not saying I would have not gotten into that partnership because I think I learned a ton from that, but I think I would have been, you know, a little bit more proactive at, you know, pushing the direction of the partnership or potentially leaving earlier than I did. Love that. Awesome. Yeah. This is a, a little bit out of left field. And I guess both of you guys can answer this, but something that interests me, have you guys started using AI in your business? And then if so, you know, how are you using it? You know, I, I have uh, to a small degree, probably should a bit more, but it's, you know, it's early days. We're trying to figure out where it slots yeah. in best. You know, I, I enjoy writing all the stuff that I do and, you know, creating all the content myself. And so I don't really want it to have a huge influence on what I'm saying uh, mm -hmm. online, but it is really good for building out, changing your headlines, making them more appealing, uh, finding hooks for, you know, posts and videos, building outlines, kind of giving you the structure and the bones mm -hmm. of what you're doing. That's, I think, where it really sings and you kind of can specialize in your own tone and your own voice. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's where the, the the marriage works best, at least for, for my world. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same as far as that goes. I mean, I, I want it to be everything that I produce, everything, every content piece that I produce, you know, I want people to to know it's from me and you know, a lot of people have told me that I have, you know, a certain way of doing things and they can tell when the content is from me without seeing my name on top a lot of times, you know, and I, I think that's part of my brand, but we still do use AI a lot. All right. And what Josh said, hooks. Okay. I use AI a lot for hooks, um, subject lines for emails, you know, how to, um, how to name webinars, you know, things like that, trying to figure out, you know, it, it's just, it just helps, helps a little bit with the creativity, you know, so we have an idea for a webinar, we'll go to chat GPT or BARD, you know, um, one of the, those are the two tools that, that we use the most. Um, they're, they're, anyway, they're little nuances on, on what they're good at, but we'll just start brain using, using the AI tool to help us brainstorm, you know, different titles, you know, and, you know, one of the favorite things to, for me to put in there is another, 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 you know, and it, it'll help us, you know, see different ideas and we, we can play off of it. So it, it's like a third person in a brainstorming, you know, um, you know, or an extra person in the brainstorm session. Um, the other thing we use AI for is a lot of our outreach. Uh, we have a couple of tools that we use that uh, help us target individuals on, on marketing, you know, and it's, you know, it's not rocket science, but, you know, we're, we're basically, you know, doing LinkedIn searches. We, we use tools, you know, AI tools that help us do that. Very cool. All right. Awesome. We, you know, we use a lot of AI on, on the content side in our property management company, but I just feel, you know, AI is obviously here to stay and I just want to be on the right side of the wave. So I'm always asking, like, I'm always curious to see how people are using it and see if we can, um, you know, implement that in our, our business as well. So thanks for sharing. Uh, last question that I have is, how do you see the multifamily uh, market evolving over the next five to 10 years? We're in a really weird time with interest rates and inflation. So how do you see that that playing out? And then do you see any opportunities that you're looking to capitalize on? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting. It kind of, I think, 
over the next 10 years, it really depends on the, the, the part of the 10 years that you're, you know, looking at in the next, you know, one to two to three years, it's much different than the overall outlook over 10. I think as a whole, the multifamily industry, uh, you know, there's a lot of wind behind its sails still. And there's, you know, the, there's a gigantic supply chain, you know, not supply chain, uh, supply issue with, with units. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a huge demand for them and there's just, they're not there. That's why you see developments popping up everywhere. So mm -hmm. we're still seeing, you know, rents climb. Uh, it's just a question of, at least in the short term, as you mentioned with interest rates, it's a question of what kind of debt terms you can get and where that can drive, you know, your purchase price, your ability to sell. That's really what's dictating it the most. You can have properties that are performing really well right now, and they might not get the price that they actually really deserve because, you know, you can't get the proceeds you you would like to get to, to be well capitalized on the deal moving right. forward. Uh, and so it, it can, the, the debt terms can really dictate what's going on right now, but over the long haul, as things kind of normalize, I think it's, phenomenal buying opportunity over the next, you know, one to two years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. You know, it really depends on, you know, how wide you're opening your aperture. You know, if, if you're looking 10 years down the road and I like to look 10 to 20 years down the road, you know, we're still buying, you know, I'm probably right after we're done with this call, I'm going to go into DocuSign and sign a contract on a new property. Right. So, so we're, we're still buying. And I, I think it is a, in a lot of metros, you know, pricing on multifamily has slid 10 to 25%, depending on what metro you're in. And so are we still sliding? Probably is the answer. You know, I'm not going to try to time the bottom. I'm not going to try to, you know, wait until, you know, things start picking back up again to get in. You know, we're, we're very carefully looking at things. And as Josh said, the debt makes the market tricky right now, but I think it's a great time to buy. I think you can lock in a pretty decent basis price. Um, it's like a lot of people say it's cliche. You date the rate and marry the property. You know, if we're getting new debt, it's going to be higher than it was, you know, in the last 15, 20 years. But as long as we can make it work right now, you know, I'm confident that in the next five, five years, we'll be able to refinance into a lower rate or a better, better note. And long term, I think we're, we're still good. So awesome. Yeah. Thank you for that. Cool. So you said last question, did you come up with anything? I mean, anything else uh, pop into your head? No, not necessarily. I just, you know, like that one is, is just, again, you know, along with the AI question, I'm just, I'd like to, to get as many um, opinions as possible. I, I agree. I think it's a fantastic time to buy if you can make the numbers work, but man, that is, uh, seems to be pretty tricky sometimes with some of these sellers. Yeah. And really, you know, what I'm finding on the buy side is people who don't need to sell aren't selling, right? Yeah, you know, sure. it's it's the people that need to sell that are selling. And sometimes you're seeing distressed property. Well, maybe not distressed properties, distressed loans that are coming out. The properties may be, you know, cash flowing and doing well, but, you know, interest rates come up or rate caps expire and, you know, so some sellers are, are trying to offload those before that ticking time bomb explodes, you know, and so that kind of deal you'll see on the market, you know, we're buying one right now where the seller has another deal that is underwater. And in order to keep that one from, from sinking, he's selling a couple of other properties, moving the money from one property to the other. So that's, that's the space where you're finding, you know, sellers that are willing to come down on price is the ones that are really motivated to sell. But yeah, people who don't have to sell right now, it's smart just to hold on. You know, if, if, if you've got another couple of years, you got fixed rate debt, you know, and you're making your monthly payments, there's no reason to sell right now. Wait right. till the, the market picks back up and, you know, maybe rates will come back down. Maybe they don't, who knows, but eventually the market will adjust and, and pick back up. So, yep. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. Well, that about wraps it up. So I got one last question for each of you. Uh, Josh, you get to go first. How can listeners learn more about you? Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you can go to learn to learn to selfdirect.com to find the mm -hmm. course. Otherwise I run my company called wall to main. So you can go to wall to main .com mm -hmm. to, to see our investment opportunities. Awesome. And I assume that's, you know, wall street to main street is yeah. what that's, uh, yeah, that's on? the concept. Awesome. Cool. And we'll put links to both those in the show notes. Jason, same question for you. How can listeners learn more about you? 
you can um, you can either go to investwithlandmark.com or if you want to uh, reach out directly, you can go to or uh, email me at jason at landmarkrgc.com. All right. Sounds good. We'll get that in the show notes as well. And, uh, you know, last thing, thanks guys for coming on the show. Very much appreciate it. And uh, I think we had a really, really good discussion here. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of Titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to thetribeoftitans.info and we'll see you there.